thank you everyone for joining us in the second event of the 2022 webinar, the Gene Drive webinar series organized by ISAA and the, Gen and the um, Outreach Network for Gene Drive Research. We have distinguished uh, speakers, three of them. The first is Dr. Heidi Mitchell, the Director of the Contained Dealings Evaluation Section, Office of the Gene Technology Regulator of the Australian Department of Health. Since joining OGTR in 2006, she prepared many risk assessments for a range of GMOs and worked in the regulatory practice section at the interface between scientific risk assessment and operational uh, regulatory policy. She also represented Australia at the OECD and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Our second speaker is Dr. Viba Ahuja, who serves as Chief General Manager of Biotech Conservation Consortium Limit, India Limited. She has more than 25 years experience in biosafety and regulatory aspects, particularly on genetically modified organisms. Dr. Ahuja is well-versed in issues related to the Indian biosafety regulatory framework and has been actively involved in capacity building initiatives in India and South Asia. Dr. Ahuja and I uh, met in some of the APARI events and she sends me a regular newsletter of the South Asia Biosafety Program. Mm -hmm. Our third speaker is Dr. Hector Kemada, the Principal Research Associate at Western Michigan University. He works with the Foundation for the National Institutes on capacity building initiatives on gene drive, te gene drive technologies for African regulators. Dr. Kemada was the founder, or the founder of Crop Technology Consulting, a firm conducting technical and biosafety assessments and developing regulatory approval dossiers for public and private crop development organization. Um, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak at this webinar. So I've been asked the question, do we need a new regulatory framework to ensure gene drives are safe? So for those of you who are in a hurry, I'll answer the question now. So no, I believe the existing framework is suitable. So I will spend the rest of my talk um, discussing the reason for my answer and what other organisations believe. Next slide, please. So the, um, the talk's going to be split into four parts. Um, I'll briefly talk about the Australian gene technology legislation and um, how we do risk assessments of GMOs and then move into risk assessments of gene drive organisms and then the discussions that are going on in international organisations. Next slide, please. So in Australia, we have dedicated gene technology legislation, which is the Gene Technology Act that came into force in the year 2000. So this act was designed to integrate with existing product regulators to form a legislative framework for GMOs. So the Gene Technology Act regulates live and viable GMOs and other legislation regulates GM products and potentially GMOs based on their intended uses, such as in food or therapeutics or crop protection products. So all of these product regulators consult the OGTR in their assessments and we consult these agencies in our assessments. So the regulation fits together so there's no duplication between regulators but there are also no gaps. Unlike many countries, the decision maker is one person known as the gene technology regulator. So the regulator consults widely with scientific experts and the Ministry for Environment and other regulatory agencies, but ultimately the regulator makes the decision whether or not to approve work with GMOs. 
The assessment of any risks from GMOs is made on the basis of the scientific evidence. It's a comparative assessment where the GMO is assessed against its non-GM parent organism. Um, we also regulate work all the way from um, lab work through to trials, through to commercial releases for many types of organisms, microbes, plants, and animals. Next slide, please. So I've put up this slide on the object of the act to cover what we do and what we don't regulate. So our focus is on health and the environment. So we have no socioeconomic assessment, unlike other countries in the region. We also can't consider trade impacts and we can't consider benefits. So this is interesting in the context of gene drives as we can't weigh up possible harms of a gene drive versus the, versus the harm that the gene drive is supposed to mitigate against. So the harm that an invasive species is causing or the health impacts of a mosquito vector disease. We also have to manage risk. So we don't need to have no risk and we can only manage risks from gene technology. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of experience of regulation of GMOs. So this slide illustrates some of the GMOs that the regulator has approved for environmental release in Australia. So she has approved 129 trials. So these are field trials with plants, um, as well as clinical trials for human therapeutics and also animal vaccine trials. The regulator has also issued 37 licenses for kind of commercial large scale environmental release. And these are, the species are clustered in the bottom right of the slide. They're cotton, canola, safflower, blue carnations, there are seven human vaccines against disease, a poultry vaccine, a melanoma treatment, and two gene therapies. So as you can see, there are currently no GM animals approved in Australia. And we have no applications for gene drives for release into the environment. Next slide, please. So this, I understand um, Hector is going to talk about risk analysis. So I just wanted to put up one slide to illustrate the principles of our risk analysis. And these are the principles that we would continue to apply to any new types of GMOs. So generally, we've tried to adapt and adopt existing guidance, um, such as the International Standard for Risk Management, the ISO 3100. Thousand um, and the OECD um, documents. So you can see at the bottom there the uh, OECD triangle that was developed in 1986, where you're looking at the trait environment and the biology and how they interact. Um, we also do a qualitative comparative assessment versus the baseline. We focus on harm and plausible pathways to harm. Um, so we look at what could go wrong and in what way could this happen? And a plausible pathway has to have steps that are all likely to occur. Um, we try to distinguish events versus harm. So we don't think of simply the existence of a GMO as a harm. It actually has to cause um, something, has to cause harm. So it has to do something bad. Um, we use regulatory science and data to support decision making. So all our assessments are based on scientific data. Um, obviously, an interesting talk is around the difference between research science and regulatory science. And often regulatory science is trying to prove that something won't happen, which is quite different to research science. Um, and with research science, you can carry on um, for a long time collecting data, with regulatory science, there's usually an end point where a regulator has to make a decision, um, even if there is uncertainty. Next slide, please. Um, I've put up this picture um, because I think the targets that people are talking about for gene drives in Australia are slightly different to those in other countries. 
Um, we have a lot of deliberately introduced species in Australia, some of which are illustrated here. So red foxes, uh, the carp fish, uh, cane toads, uh, rabbits and mice. Um, the cane toads were introduced to control pest beetles in sugarcane crops and have become a very invasive pest. Um, we also have the accidentally introduced red fire ants and probably most controversially, feral cats. So these would be originally domestic cats that have escaped and then have bred um, in the wild and cause a lot of damage to our native wildlife. Next slide, please. Um, although I said we have no experience of assessing environmental release of gene drive GMOs in Australia, we do have experience of assessing um, gene drives in labs, in containment. So we have assessed a plant pathogenic fungi gene drive, um, a mouse containing a gene drive, and also Drosophila uh, flies containing gene drives. Um, in the case of the Drosophila, this was a split gene drive, so it has its own um, safe, has its own method to prevent the gene drive, a whole gene drive getting out into the environment. These assessments focused on the likelihood of this GMO escaping into the environment. And because of the control measures that were put around them, these were approved. Next slide, please. So what about taking that knowledge and experience of releases of GMOs and the knowledge for contained work with gene drives to do risk assessments of releases of gene drive? So this is some of the messages from the debate about gene drives, which would lead you to the conclusion that we need a new toolbox with a completely new set of tools. It's been the suggestion that these are unprecedented. There's nothing comparable to gene drives. There are dread consequences. Our previous experience would not be helpful. And how would we contain them, both physically and also geographically um, between different countries or regions? Next slide, please. Now, I believe there are some challenges with gene drives, but I don't believe these are insurmountable with the current tools. Um, there are obviously containment and irreversibility is a challenge with gene drives, but we also have other organisms, say um, genetically modified canola or other plants which shed pollen. These don't respect state or national borders either. So the challenge from containment and GMOs moving between countries is not unprecedented. Um, also the conflicted values, um, the environment versus human health, which has been raised for GM mosquitoes. Um, we already face those issues now. Um, we're currently assessing a cancer treatment using a live genetically modified animal pathogen. Um, this virus is not present in Australia. Mm -hmm. And if it escaped from the clinical trial, it could devastate the horse racing and pork industry, but it could save people's lives. So this is already a debate that's going on outside of gene drives. There are also the values, so native versus exotic. Um, I've put a picture here up of a possum, which in Australia we think is a cute native animal. Um, but I know my colleagues in New Zealand think it's an introduced pest that should be made into slippers. Um, the values may also be derived from generally accepted community or agricultural practices. So the community generally accepts that it's appropriate to control certain insect or weed pests for the benefit of food production. We also have the comparative assessment. So the risk um, from the GMO versus the risk overall, or the risk of doing nothing. Now, unfortunately, this is the benefit that some regulators, such as um, in Australia, that we can't consider this. 
Um, we would also need a deep understanding of population biology, reproduction, food webs, and ecological functions. And there is a general lack of this kind of data compared to, say, crop plants. Um, so where can we look to for guidance on how to perform risk assessments of gene drives? So there are lots of um, assessments that have been done. So I've talked earlier about GMO risk assessments. Um, we also have lots of experience of biological control risk assessments um, where we're looking at the impacts on the introduction of a species or removal of a pest. Um, sterile insect release using gamma irradiation. Um, there are billions of mass reared insects, which are not GM, but they're released into the wild each week around the world. So many of these are non-native pest species. They're reared, irradiated, and distributed. Um, in addition to sterile releases, there are also fertile biological control agents which have been released. And mosquitoes infected with strains of Wolbachia bacteria, which are intended to reduce their ability to transport dengue, have been released in the wild to establish self-replicating populations of infected mosquitoes. Um, there are also millions of pollinators, such as honeybees, released on a regular basis um, in both protected areas and field crops. And certainly from the Australian point of view, these are a non-native species that potentially um, outcompetes the native um, pollinators. We also know a lot about conventional pest control and species conservation. Um, we know about weed control and vector control, so eradication of say mosquitoes and how to measure the impacts on the ecosystem. Um, we also know about containment of dangerous pathogens in the lab, and this information can be used to provide appropriate containment of gene dra drives in the labs when needed. And this gives us information about risk assessment, risk management, and also how to communicate these risks. Now, I was going to move on um, to the other organisations that are looking at gene drives. Um, so whilst each country has its own sovereign regulatory process, there are also some international organisations who are looking at gene drives. So the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD as it's known, has a membership of 196 countries. They've recently been discussing release of GMOs and organisms developed using synthetic biology, which would include gene drives, and then gene drives explicitly since 2018. Um, thank you to uh, Florida who produced the most of this text. Um, I've added some recent text onto the bottom, but basically the CBD has suggested that new risk assessment guidance should be developed around gene drive, and there should be a precautionary approach to the release of gene drive organisms. Now the WHO, the World Health Organization, has also um, issued a very good summary. I've put this guidance framework document reference at the bottom of um, the slide, um, and I would recommend this as a read. I realize that Hector Cormada and um, Viva Huga both contributed to this document. Um, and the key point in orange that I wanted to flag here was the risk analysis frameworks used for other technologies provide useful precedents for the risk analysis of genetically modified mosquitoes. And they also suggest that you need to do risk analysis, um, looking at protection goals, and it's a case-by-case -case assessment, and it should involve both national and regional regulators. Um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, has also taken a stance on gene drive, um, and they have recommended that the use of synthetic biology in nature conservation would be debated and voted on at their next Congress in 2024. And they're currently calling for um, people to remain neutral on synthetic biology until they have developed a position. It was interesting to note that in the previous version of this that went to the Congress, um, they the recommendation was people should refrain from supporting or endorsing research 
um, until this had been passed. So this is my final slide. And I just wanted to summarise that I believe we can use existing regulatory frameworks for gene drive risk assessments. Um, we can build on these existing um, GMO frameworks, but also other frameworks. Um, we should borrow from other disciplines. We know a lot about um, biology and there is no need for us to reinvent a new framework, but we should also carry on talking and sharing knowledge. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Isa, for inviting me to share my views on this topic. Very interesting and a novel technology, which is in the pipeline, that is the gene drive organisms. Uh, I've been given the uh, topic of uh, are we ready to uh, regulate gene drive organisms and what are the broadly the capacity building needs. Dr. Heidi has uh, given a very nice presentation and actually set the stage on you know what exactly is required to regulate gene drive tools uh, organisms and what kind of tools and regulatory frameworks are already in place. Uh, thank you for that and. Uh, as is with any innovative technology, the capacity building is very is a key to you know uh, understanding these technologies and uh, having the confidence among the regulators and the public trust uh, for you know introducing uh, innovative technologies. But it is always whenever the new innovations come, it's a very multifaceted and a multi-stakeholder endeavor. There will be lots of concerns in the minds of people, but they all need to be you know dealt with properly. Innovators would also raise a lot of questions for policymakers and regulators. They would, they would seek guidance and which would ultimately inform their decisions. So capacity building is the key to implement appropriate regulations and facilitate decision making whenever we want to make uh, use of you know, innovative technologies, innovations uh, for the benefit of the society and to meet the challenges. You know, we have huge challenges in the society now. Uh, if you think about mosquitoes, the example which Heidi gave, the in the developing world, you know, all these uh, dengue, Zika, all those things are big challenges, and we really need novel technologies to deal with them. But whenever it comes, you know, we have seen in the past also any kind of modern biotechnologies. Whenever there were discussions, including gene drives, suddenly there is a whole lot of you know points which which would be raised. Somebody will talk of benefits, risk communication, biodiversity loss, impact on non-targets, what happens to, you know, as if the populations will get, get uh, devastated, are the contained facilities enough, are we prepared, how the environmental safety would be dealt with, there will be a lot of discussions about ethical considerations, and this leads to, you know, if you look at this slide, I've just put a few of them, and this is like arrows here and there, and a lot of confusion which is created whenever we have to, uh, you know, uh, deal with these technologies. And that makes uh, sometimes even the regulators very confused, you know, what is to be looked at and what is not to be looked at. And the whole process becomes very cautious. Now, but if we look at this, you know, concerns broadly, they will always be, can be easily categorized into scientific considerations and the non-scientific considerations. So it is very important that the biosafety regulators are looking at these, these, uh, you know, uh, these um, concerns and the regulatory system looks at them at appropriate stage, taking into consideration the regulatory, uh, you know, guidance and other things available. Now, when it comes to the regulation of gene drive organisms, again, we in the in the these these organisms are also developed using modern biotechnology. So we already have the biosafety regulatory systems which are responsible for regulating products of modern biotechnology. And how are these implemented? They are implemented through regulatory instruments like acts, rules, and policies. We just heard uh, Dr. Heidi talking about uh, uh, the OGTR. And similarly, every uh, the, I mean, the act which is, through which uh, this, these uh, products are regulated in Australia. Similarly, all other countries have their own regulatory instruments. Sometimes it's policies, rules, et cetera. 
And then uh, the review of applications and decision making processes are there, which are supported by the scientific guidelines on a case by case basis for different categories of organisms, uh, which are updated from time to time. The review process would include in a more mature systems by the in-house officials, whereas in most countries uh, in the developing world by the uh, technical experts as well as inter-ministerial committees, you know, it's a more committee-based system. And then public consultations are generally held prior to decision making. Now, in this whole process, if I summarize it, in terms of the capacity requirements, what do we need? We need a functional regulatory system in a country. We need scientific guidelines and resources which would provide, you know, help in providing the, uh, risk assessment and also for the resources for the baseline information. We need a trained human resource, which is uh, the key requirement for looking at these innovations and, you know, uh, regulating them. And then public awareness and participation, of course, is important. I would just like to quickly look at each of them. So if you look at the biosafety regulatory framework, you see most countries have biosafety regulations uh, as a result of either initiatives at the state level, at the national level, where there were already research activities were, uh, you know, research was uh, in active stages. There also the biosafety regulatory frameworks emerged, like in Australia, in US, even in India, we have a very good, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a systematic framework in terms of which ministry will regulate, what committees are in place, what is the process and so on. And there are many other countries where the regulatory frameworks have been set up after they became party to the Katarina Protocol on Biosafety. And there were a lot of capacity building projects under which the national frameworks are in place. Competent authorities are designated in most countries we, uh, in, uh, which are parties to the protocol as well as even otherwise to designate uh, the, the, these uh, authorities which would receive the application by the researcher and the technology developers. Biosafety regulations, as Heidi uh, also mentioned, are more inclined for plants as there is a limited experience with other, other categories of organisms such as mosquitoes. I'll give you an example. In our country, you see, we, we started working with the, there was a group working with the silkworms and it has taken a lot of time uh, to move forward because there were not guidelines and application forms, etc. Uh, so this, this limited experience, of course, uh, one can use the previous uh, you know, knowledge with the other organisms, but it slightly slows down the process. But what exactly are the challenges and on which we will base the, our capacity building requirements? So as I mentioned, you know, regulatory systems are mostly consisting of committees as compared to the dedicated secretariats in, in the uh, mature regulatory systems. So what during the course of the product development and the application review, many times there will be changes in the members, change in the members. And so, you know, the developer has to explain again and the, the variation in the understanding would lead to in increased information requirements. Guidelines and the data requirement are accordingly, you know, as I have indicated, they're interpreted differently by the committee members. Implementing procedures for research, okay. testing, maintained and confined conditions may not be there, fully, fully defined. And then one thing which is missing is the system of formal consultations with regulators prior to submitting the applications, which also, you know, needs to be looked at. The second important part is the scientific guidelines and resources. Internationally accepted methodologies are in place for most of the products of modern biotechnology. And as soon as the new innovation comes, these agencies start working, as we have seen with under the Convention on Biological Diversity, also some initiatives are there, but the scientific bodies like Codex, WHO, and so on, they work and they come out with the guidelines and a lot of resources. OECD provides a lot of resources in terms of biology documents, consensus documents, and all that. Rigorous data requirements are for pre-pocket safety assessment are in place. As per these guidelines, very, very well planned, easy to understand, and uh, systematic science-based uh, data requirements are there in these international guidelines, and they form they should form the basis of your regulating the uh, gene drives.
And as I said, baseline information is also available. Coming specifically to the genetically modified uh, mosquitoes, we can see that uh, 2014 itself, uh, the WHO, after the lot of uh, you know uh, years of work and involvement of experts from many very many countries, they came up with a WHO guidance framework, which has further been revised in 2021, which was highlighted by Heidi. They also brought out a training manual for biosafety for human health and uh, uh, and the environment in the context of potential use. As I was mentioning about the baseline information, OECD came out with the biology document on Aedes aegypti, and I understand that more are under preparation. We have to take note of this fact that these guidance documents are led by highly credible scientific international agencies, and they are harmonized, you know, based on the need of like the, the committees which are there for consensus documents, biology documents, or the guidelines. They have participation of experts from various countries and the information relevant to, uh, to these countries is also taken into account. These are consultative processes and, and based on years of discussion and uh, you know, a lot of references, peer reviewed literature and all is considered. The third important component where we need more attention is the trained human resource. In most of the uh, regulatory systems we have, we have worked with, we have seen that there is a limited expertise in risk assessment and the risk management uh, of these, uh, you know, the, the distinction itself is not very clear. So you end up asking for a lot of data requirements and other things and, and slowing down of the decisions. Technical expertise required in multiple disciplines may or may not be there. And most of the time it is the research scientists who are members of these regulators. So height and then third point which I highlighted was the high turnover of regulators. And uh, the third, fourth point is that when we have interministerial uh, representatives involved in the decision making, sometimes they are not well versed with the novel technologies. And that is why this is one component where we really need a lot of efforts. Capacity building is necessary. You, we can have a, we have a biosafety regulatory framework. We have the guidelines in place based on which the national, national decisions, national guidelines can be framed. But the trained human resource is one of the very important areas where you know, we need uh, capacity building for uh, taking forward these uh, innovative projects. So the fourth one, of course, is the public participation and awareness. Public part debate is often, uh, we have seen, is influenced by misper misperceptions, inaccurate, and sometimes false information. But what, uh, what we have seen in terms of missing in capacity building is the strategic communication plans, you know, these are all piecemeal initiatives and sometimes we are not able to target uh, the exact uh, proper participation of the public. And this includes skilled communicators are required, spokespersons, developing key material and the delivery formats as per the local needs. Now, just to a little more on the public participation, because one thing very important is the identification of the target audience. The public is not a homogeneous population. So you have to identify which group, every group is a distinct audience and we need to, we need to work towards answering their questions and concerns with the appropriate level of detail. So different groups have to be, uh, to provide relevant information to answer these questions and the, as I said, are required. So with all this background, uh, the main question that we started with, are we ready to regulate? and where exactly we need to highlight the capacity building initiatives. According to my, uh, you know, a bit of analysis and understanding, I feel that biosafety regulatory frameworks are in place. We don't need to re redo the, or do we, we do not need a separate framework for that. We have guidelines and resource documents developed by the international agencies. They can be used and customized if required to the, uh, to the local, uh, requirement and uh, very, very well, I mean, we have seen our food safety guidelines, Codex's guidelines are the ones which were prepared after 12 years of discussion and they have been adopted by all countries, uh, which work very well. So even in case of gene drives, the initiatives taken by WHO, OECD, all these resources are available and there is no need to reinvent the wheel by starting the preparation of the guidelines de novo. But where we need to highlight the, uh, where we need to focus 
in terms of the capacity building is the trained human resource which is urgently required for the effective decision making to permit the testing and release and also the public awareness is extremely important because that is something which you know sometimes if you have a too negative a campaign the decision makers are not able to take decision and uh, the but the public awareness has to be done in a very planned manner so that we can have their effective participation effective responses to the to the you know consultations when when uh, the the government uh, the regulators put up the documents for consultation So uh, I'd like to begin by just mentioning that one basic concept in risk assessment is that they're done on a case by case basis. So in order to uh, illustrate the point, I just like to begin by reviewing the different cases where gene drives might be used and this is going to be of course a non-comprehensive list, but I'll just give you a sense of the variety of the work. Now we've heard most about the applications for public health and especially the application of gene drives to help eliminate mal malaria the two approaches there that are being contemplated are population suppression and then population replacement or modification the first of course is self explanatory and the second means modifying a population of mosquitoes so that they can't transmit plasmodium anymore um then of course in another public or another health related project is a project to reduce the population of rodents that are hosts for ticks that carry Lyme disease um in the area of conservation we can there's work to control invasive rodent species that prey on vulnerable bird species especially in islands and lead to their extinction you've heard from Heidi about work that's uh going on in 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 Australia f f on a number of different areas including the cane toad and then there are there's work contemplated on invasive aquatic species such as the sea lamprey and golden mussel and so they're also being considered as potential targets for gene drive control methods so this is a much wider range of applications than we've seen so far our experience so far has been largely in agriculture particularly gm crops although gene drives can also be beneficial to agriculture in areas like uh, control of rodent or insect pests for example uh, so because of this range um, a one size fits all risk assessment in keeping with the theme of our present webinar series isn't going to be possible again a fact that most gm regulators and risk assessors know already at this point now of the projects that um I've just talked about and just the range of projects of uh, only one really has gone far enough to do sort of case specific biosafety research and I'll mention that project later but before that groundwork has been laid by efforts to do early problem formulation at least for mosquitoes with gene drives um so for example the national institutes of health in the united states did a problem formulation exercise in 2017 followed by a series of four regional consultations held by the african union that followed a similar format then of course the uh, european food safety authority also held a problem formulation workshop on gene drives involving stakeholders from different parts of the world but to my knowledge there's really only one more targeted problem formulation exercise that's been done and that's by the target malaria project they have a more defined product which has allowed them to do this um that's an anopheles gambi containing the double sex gene it changes the morphology of females so that they have an intermediate sexual characteristics and so can't bite and also can't reproduce so the population of um, mosquitoes goes down and here's an example i'm not going to go into this in detail but here's an example of the kind of analysis they've gone into and those who are familiar with risk assessments of gm crops will recognize this as a just a standard pathway to harm analysis um that's been then applied um to the questions about uh, gene drives in mosquitoes as well 
The same group has also started what they call an ecological observatory in Ghana, where they're taking data on community ecology of Anopheles Gambi that will help them predict the ecosystem impact of eliminating or reducing the mosquito species. But I should also mention that the, the literature already indicates that this impact will most likely be minimal. And I'm referring you here, if you can see it, to a paper by Collins et al. on this topic that was published in 2018. Uh, beyond problem formulation, though, there have been some risk assessments that have been done that are not on actual synthetic gene drive examples, but can foreshadow what might be done for them. So, uh, last last time you heard about the example of Wolbachia from Owen Edwards, which is a natural driving system, then there are two risk assessments that have been done by CSIRO in Australia. Um, this is on the risk of introducing into contained use and then on to small scale field release, a male sterile genetically engineered mosquito. Then there's also a recent paper uh, on a hypothetical mouse with gene drive construct. And this latter paper is meant to illustrate the type of risk assessment that is recommended by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2016 in their report on gene drives on the horizon. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail uh, later on in my talk. One common feature of all these risk assessments that I'm showing here is their use of uh, Bayesian belief networks. And you might not be familiar with that, but it's an approach to risk assessment that's been used in a lot of other risk assessment disciplines. And I and I think it can be useful in cases where there's a lack of empirical data because it provides a way to access expert opinion that you can use in at least the initial stages of gene drive work when empirical data aren't readily available or would be difficult or impossible to get. Then this input's used to develop quantitative risk models. Now, this is not to say that the methods that we're already familiar with aren't useful for gene drive risk assessments. I mention this approach here because of the NASM report, but also because of its use already in similar systems. Uh, but in keeping with the theme of not one size fits all, my personal opinion is that it's good for risk assessors to become familiar with these other approaches so that in the end, they can decide which approach is fit for purpose. So next, I'd like to talk about what scientific or regulatory bodies have looked at in terms of the adequacy of current risk assessment methodologies relative to gene drives. I'm going to start with the U.S. National Academy's report. And they call for a uh, probabilistic risk assessment to be done consistent with the 1998 EPA guidelines on ecological risk assessment. Now, this Nas uh, National Academy's report talks about this approach as somehow different from the qualitative assessments that have already been done by regulatory agencies who've reviewed GM crops. But those of you who've done risk assessment of GM crops will realize that you've really used the EPA approach already. So uh, what's being recommended in this report really isn't that great a departure from existing approaches. And the difference is that you, you would be conducting or that they advocate using a more quantitative and probabilistic analysis. Now, whether it's better, risk better leads to better risk assessments, um, I return to my view that as practical government risk assessors, the approach taken should be fit for purpose. And um, at this point, the quality of the risk assessments, whether it's a qualitative or quantitative approach in terms of its, uh, you know, whether or not they've been, um, well, whether, whether we compare the, the results of those risk assessments relative to a specific outcome and whether those are one approach is more effective than the other, I think is still to be demonstrated. And um, I would think that there are uh, people in the audience tonight, uh, today that would take issue with me on that, but um, th that's my opinion. <laughs> Sorry to spend so much time on that, so I'll move on. Um, you've already heard from Heidi about the Australian Academy of Science opinion, uh, so I won't say more about that. The Dutch uh, National Institute for Public Health and the Environment concluded that current methodology uh, for environmental risk assessment for GMOs 
released into the environment is also suitable for use with organisms with gene drives. But they say additional knowledge uh, on the effects at the population level are needed. Now, interestingly enough, the same body concluded that for contained use, their current risk classifications aren't suitable and so provided specific guidance in that area. The European Food Safety Authority also conducted an assessment and concluded that the existing risk assessment framework for genetically modified insects can serve as the basis for engineered gen gene drive insects, but mentioned that there might be areas where they uh, there would be updating that would be needed. And I'm just going to show them to you here and not go into each of these points, but you can glance at them now and then you can look up the EFSA document later um, at your leisure. And then finally, um, I'd like to mention the U United States uh, Novel and Exceptional Technology and Research Advisory Committee, which was formerly the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee. This body also didn't propose an entirely new risk assessment paradigm, but like the the F but like EFSA. Um, did identify areas that required more consideration, and I'm just showing them to you here. Again, I'm not going to read each point, but we'll refer. Uh, you can refer to that document later on uh, as well. Now, these two documents are in rough agreement, and I should, but I should point out one thing that uh, they and other um, people who've talked about risk assessment generally mention, and that is the point that modeling uh, will most likely be a more significant tool in risk assessment than it has been in the past because of the limited data that we have to work with right now with, uh, with gene drive organisms. So uh, risk assessments will be more complicated, but the risk assessment experience, as Heidi has also pointed out, um, gained with previous GMOs can be a solid base to address the additional complexity. But also, as Hadi has pointed out, the additional complexity doesn't mean that they've not been dealt with before in risk assessments of other organisms, such as um, those that have been in, uh, in, been used for classical biocontrol or um, the, the risk assessments that have been done with invasive species. There are also other ecological disciplines, such as those that look into risks and um, effects with um, the, uh, associated with the practice of assisted migration, for example, that can be used and borrowed from. And then, of course, I mentioned again the Wolbachia example that that uh, we've talked about a few times. Now, at this point, I'd also like to say a few words about socioeconomic considerations because it's been mentioned in the next track document as well as, well as uh, discussed in other fora that relate to genetically engineered organisms. Um, and I just want to point out that the risk assessments that we normally do, uh, whether or not they contain uh, any kind of socioeconomic assessments, really are only one of the inputs that are into the decision-making process. So socioeconomic considerations will undoubtedly be taken into account um, in any decision regarding gene drives. But there are also already other instruments available, such as environmental impact assessments, like um, what is mentioned by the by UNEP, and then also other things like the impact uh, environmental impact assessments, or environmental social socioeconomic and health assessments, or strategic uh, environmental assessments. All these already have established methodologies that include socioeconomic considerations. And people who are used to and experienced in doing them. So uh, other countries also may require them for certain projects. So uh, for those where it's not part of their risk assessment pro process already, um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel here. Finally, I'd like to end by mentioning some guidance documents that are already out there or in preparation that could be useful for gene drive risk assessment. So, of course, there's the Cartagena Protocol, Annex 3. Uh, since synthetic gene drives are LMOs, they fall within the Cartagena Protocol. And the, the Cartagena Protocol, OTTEG, has um, decided that risk assessment, additional risk assessment, is needed for... Um, to supplement the already existing guidance on gene drive I mean, on GMOs that they spent so many years uh, working on. 
Uh, I expect that this uh, additional guidance will also take uh, several years to complete. And my personal opinion is that it'll probably not that add that much value to what Annex 3 already says, um, much like the parent document did. And uh, the problem there is I think that, you know, it will likely be that the guidance, like the parent document that was produced, is too complicated to be practical. So, um, but as, other than that, we we also have the WHO guidance document focused on gene drives that's already been mentioned, and that supplements earlier guidance on the development of genetically engineered mosquitoes. Um, and then, uh, uh, of course, the, as I mentioned a couple of times already here, the um, the Wolbachia example is also a good guide. And finally, there are gene drive specific guidances that have been developed by certain authorities, of course, uh, starting with Australia, for example, and the Netherlands, I've already mentioned, but then also the American Committee on Medical Entomology um, has recently revised their arthropod containment guidelines, whoops, sorry, uh, their arthropod containment guidelines, and they recommend uh, containment levels, what they call enhanced arthropod containment level two, which is comparable to your general biosafety level two containment. Um, then um, finally, I want to mention that the African Union Development Agency is also soon to release some guidelines for research and development of gene drive organisms. And these are much anticipated, and I hope they'll provide some clarity for researchers that want to develop gene drive organisms on the continent. So, um, to summarize then what I've talked about, most projects are still too early to do case-specific research on gene drive events. And um, as we've heard from uh, previous speakers today, basic risk assessments, uh, basic risk assessment approaches used with previous genetically engineered organisms are appropriate, but additional challenges need to be addressed. And we can borrow from risk assessments in other uh, other disciplines to particularly help us with things like handling uncertainty and um, the lack of data, as well as the use and incorporation of modeling in the in the risk assessment process. And we can also borrow from risk assessments that have been done in other organisms, in black classical biological control, for example, invasive species, non-synthetic drives, as well as other ecological risk assessments. And then finally, um, the value of the additional guidance that's been de been developed or is going to be developed soon has yet to be determined. Um, we we really need to see what those uh, those documents are and how how well that allow us to do good uh, risk assessments for gene drive organisms. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nina. Yeah, there's a question here about, is there any positive effect of gene drive? May I ask Heidi to, uh, to answer this one? You're mute. Is there any benefit to the use of gene drive? Was that the question? Yes. Is there any positive effect of, yes, the benefit of uh, using gene drives? Um, I don't know if you mean, so the benefit... Um, compared to a normal GMO would be how fast the trait spreads through the population. So because of the nature of gene drive, if you introduce a trait that you want to spread in the population, it will spread much faster using the gene drive. So if you want to suppress a population or have all female um, or all male, you want all male mosquitoes, or you could add a gene to cane toads to make the to make them not poisonous anymore to neutralize the poison so if the uh, wildlife other native animals were eating cane toads then they wouldn't die like they do now um sorry i don't know if the question is compared to not using a gene drive or <laughs> what could it be used to do hopefully i've covered both of those i don't know if you'd like to jump in hector well, I can just add, I guess there, there, there may be two sides to that question. Um, you know, one would be what benefits could be, uh, could be gained from some of the applications. So, you know, the, the things that Heidi, you and I talked about are, would be the, the potential for uh, reducing 
human disease or for controlling invasive species. So those would be the the benefits that are being aimed at. But uh, from a you know technological point of view, I think one important benefit for using a gene drive approach is that it in the past when we've been looking at sort of traditional um, genetically modified organisms in an agricultural setting we have the ability because of contained up with of controlled breeding to be able to spread a gene throughout the population um, and in that case it would be a population of crop plants and that would be just because we can manually do it by controlled breeding uh, in the case of trying to modify a, a wild population that's that's not you know you can't do it <laughs> the way we've done it with crop plants and so you need a mechanism like this to drive the gene to uh to the throughout the population particularly the uh, for traits that don't have a um a strong selective advantage because um in in that case there would be really no good way to drive a beneficial gene or a gene that you want to spread into a population without uh, without that selective advantage, and and in the case of uh, gene drives, you're 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 changing the 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 you're changing the the uh, the way that that the genes operate, so that you're not using natural selection to select for them, but you're using uh, molecular selection or competitive mechanisms to to drive that gene throughout the population. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Kemada, for the answers. Yeah, next we have a question here for Dr. Ahuja. What are the current trials related to gene drive technologies in India? Yeah, in India, there are no trials underway. Uh, there are one or two organizations uh, which have uh, initiated work. Uh, prominent among them was the Tata Institute of Genetics and Society and very little work in the contained facilities, but no trials as of now. Uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. There is another question for you. Could you give your Nina, views? I should... oh, sorry, Nina, uh, I should... Hector, you I should... want to, uh, to uh, add? Okay. I just should, I should mention that everybody should understand that there have been no trials of any gene drive organisms in the field anywhere in the world. And we're probably uh, quite a few years yet from, from that happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kemada. Yes, uh, yeah, if you look at the literature, there is really none yet that is. Um, but let me see, how about the genetically modified mosquito that is being tested in Brazil? That's not a driving system. Um, okay. The there it's the original the original version of it was really a male sterile, and then mm -hmm. they have a second yeah. version that that's a, sort of a limited, uh, a limited version. So it'll it'll um, propagate for about ten generations before it dies out. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, because so they are also addressing the issue of um, what is this? Um, you know, uh, continuing uh, presence in the environment. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and there's another uh, another question here addressed to Dr. Ahuja. Could you give your views in, in the incorporation of young and dynamic minds who believe in these gene-based technologies in regulatory bodies and committees? Very much. I fully feel, I think that we should have uh, more people well-versed with the technology, the practicing, you know, the practitioners also of the technology in as the members of the regulatory body bodies uh, but you know there has to be a balance of the two most of the times in our uh, you know developing countries the regulatory committees will have very very senior experts who have not you know who are not very familiar with the who have not practiced these technologies so while uh, as i said uh, the evaluation of these technologies would require multidisciplinary expertise uh, and that should involve the younger and the dynamic minds, definitely. But how do we do that is always a question. Uh, you know, people look at more experienced scientists and so on. And as I said, you know, the turnover of, turnover of all these people is also very high. 
even if you have the members who are senior you educate them and the uh, do that and by the time you know even during the application phase itself you see a lot of changes so in that sense also maybe the presence of the younger and the uh, people who are you know practicing these technologies in the laboratory they are more familiar with the techniques would be more useful Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahuja. Yeah, there's a, actually a question about risk uh, in consuming foodstuffs in uh, gene drive technology, where gene drive technology is used. As, uh, the, uh, as you have seen in the presentations, there are no food uh, crop or food organisms that are being, uh, you know, that are being modified with the gene drive technology. So at this stage, we could not answer that question. Um, this is a you know this is a question that is often raised to us in the regulation of GMOs. Instead of assessing the risk of gene drive, why can't the risk be eliminated altogether? Can we get one of you to answer this, either Hector or Doctor uh, Heidi? Um, Zero I risk could, is that possible? I could start. <laughs> yeah, I could start by answering generally that I don't think anything has zero risk. I think being uh -huh. on this webinar has some risk. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, yes. people are trying to develop uh, gene drives with uh, safety features in them so that they can be uh, stopped after a certain number of generations um, or a split drive system so that it has to be put together in order to function. So there are, yeah, there are safety features that can be incorporated in the design but I think reducing risk to nothing is not possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, among regulators, that's how we look at it. Okay, here's another one. What if gene drives lead to complete elimination of target species? Yeah, either Hector or he uh, Heidi could answer this question. Complete well, elimination I'll... of target species. Yeah, I'll... Uh... Environmental impact. I'll take I'll take a shot at this one. Um, so, you know, this is a this is a scenario that gets raised quite a bit by people who want to, um, you know, raise the alarm. I think, in my view, to a to a level that I that misunderstands how difficult it is to even get a gene drive to work in in real life um so there are a number of different factors and if you look at the papers that model for example how a gene drive might spread under different conditions you know that um, there are, there are things that 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 need to be overcome um in the design of the the gene drive construct itself for example to to allow it to so spread effectively and a lot of these have to do with um, overcoming you know things like spatial isolation or environmental conditions so it's not uh, it's not an easy thing to get something you know, a gene drive to spread um, and that at least according to the to the modeling papers uh, but then uh, the other the other thing I would like to say is that you know for at least in the in the case of mosquitoes, um, the the kinds of things that we're trying to do with gene drives are also the the objective of things that we've already been trying to do for quite some time using things like pesticides. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, the, the 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 goal of of using pesticides, for example, to control malaria carrying mosquitoes is to eradicate them um, so that they don't they don't transmit malaria anymore so anyway um, then with with gene drives this is just another tool in the toolbox to help achieve that goal thank you very much dr kemada i have another question for you so, well it says here you know from Dr. Regine, that it is always a pleasure to listen to your presentation. And the question is, how applicable are the existing assessments of risk to a context like Africa, where not only is gene drive not well understood, but is also wrapped in untrue narratives? Do you think the risk assessment outcomes would be different in such a context? Mm 
Um, well, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, yeah, I think the the thing that um, is described here isn't just unique to Africa. I think these are challenges that we we have um, in other parts of the world as well. Just the the general lack of understanding of the of the technology, which a lot of uh, the developer uh, developer groups are trying to overcome by trying to provide good, reliable information. The the group that I work with at the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health also has uh, uh, is, is trying to disseminate good, reliable information through um, our website. And uh, we also have a we also have a resource called the Gene Drive Virtual Institute. That's a repository for a lot of this information that we curate. So um, there's a there's an attempt to try to at least provide um, information that's that's so uh, well documented and hopefully neutral, but uh, in a in a reliable way. And maybe that will help to overcome some of the the problems that that is described here. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamada. I have a question here, one for Dr. Ahuja and one for, well, similar question to Dr. Heidi. How will India deal with socioeconomic considerations? Dr. Ahuja? Uh, so you see, uh, I mean, socioeconomic considerations are very important, but they need to be different from, as I said, you know, differentially treated from the scientific assessments and the socioeconomic considerations need to be dealt with separately. So what we seen in India is that, like, you know, mixing up of all these issues is the one which is resulting in delays in approval and, uh, you know, lack of understanding and so on. I'll give you an example. Our regulatory uh, regulatory requirements, our regulatory system, there is no requirement of socioeconomic considerations there. Neither do our guidelines say that. But in spite of that, you know these uh, these considerations in the past, as we have seen in case of crops, they have sort of overtaken the results of the scientific assessments. So uh, it is very important. I mean, I do not know how this would be dealt with when it comes to gene drives, because it would be even more complicated there. But uh, the, the but as uh, our uh, you know the guidelines which have been prescribed by WHO and uh, other uh, other uh, you know similar documents clearly indicate that it is very important that in case of gene drives particularly. The community engagement, the public awareness and participation should be done in parallel. So if that is undertaken in a systematic way by the developers, reaching out to different stakeholders, what all I highlighted, you know, that clearly, uh, you know, uh, reaching out to these and having a stakeholder specific material, then we might be able to, you know, uh, deal with them in a much better way. Of course, uh, you know, the, another thing which uh, socioeconomic considerations uh, uh, drive uh, uh, is also the risk benefit analysis. So malaria and all these things are big issues, you know, here in, uh, when in India, our incidence has been increasing in the recent past. And we all know that how uh, there are definitely limitations with the existing technologies for control of uh, these diseases. So I'm sure all these uh, factors will uh, be taken into consideration, the risk benefit analysis, uh, both in terms of the, I mean, in terms of the socioeconomic uh, issues also, which will drive the decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Huja. How about uh, Dr. Mitchell? How will Australia deal with socioeconomic considerations? Uh, so, I think, as I said in my talk, socioeconomic considerations are outside the scope of the Gene Technology Act that the regulator administers. Um, but we can only look at harm, not benefits, and we do a scientific assessment, not a socioeconomic assessment. But I can imagine um, that there would be other like the states and territories who would be responsible for uh, the release, um, possibly of a gene drive organism, would be doing that socioeconomic assessment and they can assess benefits. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Thanks. Mitchell.
Yeah, and here's another question. Since risk assessment and assessment of benefits of gene drives are very context specific, how transportable are risk assessments between regions and countries? So I think Hector, Dr. Kemada can answer this question. Well, I can, um, you know, I can go back to the the, the mantra, um, case by case, uh, and not only that, but it taking into consideration the receiving environment. Now, you know, that's not to say that there are certain things that can be transportable. Uh, for example, some, you know, basic uh, life cycle studies that might have been conducted in the laboratory. Um, those would be, you know, those would be transportable regardless of where where you where you go because it's uh, you know obtained in the lab so those are the kinds of things that could be useful um, to help predict how things might behave in the in the field but yeah, again we, we have you know we, we have years of uh, experience already by people you know, who have been doing risk assessments taking into consideration that the receiving environment may vary from one place to another and therefore needs to be taken into consideration in your risk assessments. Thank you very much, Dr. Kemada. Here is one question for, for either you or Dr. Michel. Um, is there relevance or is there, can we use gene drive design choices in reducing risk? This is the last question of the day. <laughs> Sorry for those who have uh, submitted their questions. Uh, we have limited time. And I would like to invite Dr. Mahalechumi Aruchanan, who is the Global Coordinator of ISAA and the Executive Director of the Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center. She also serves as a pub public participation and out outreach strategy development specialist for the UNFA of Sri Lanka Biosafety Program and as an adjunct lecturer at Monash University, Malaysia and AMST University. Dr. Arujanan, your, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Halos. Thank you so much for the very uh, good moderation and also to all the speakers who were, who were very clear and for the enriching uh, topics. Now, before I close the webinar, I want to get your attention to the chat box where my colleagues have posted the evaluation post webinar evaluation survey. Please fill up uh, that. And once you've done that, we will start sending out the certificates to you. We know that many of you have asked for certificates. So I think... Um, the wording from the expert is out that the current existing policies and framework is enough uh, to regulate and monitor gene drive. But of course, we still need a lot of knowledge, data and information and um, to, uh, to regulate gene drives or GMOs derived from gene drives. And that is why ISA with Outreach Network for Gene Drive Research have this regular series of webinar on gene drive. And um, I think it was Dr. Uh, Dr. Harlos who said that transferable skills or experience that um, is very important that we have for many years, for three decades now, we are very well versed with genetic modification, but this knowledge in other gene technologies is going to help us to regulate gene drive in a scientific manner. So for the next uh, webinar, the topic is socioeconomic assessment, and that will be held on 20, uh, July 28th, same time, same format. So please block your diary. Now, uh, all presentation will be posted on ISA website. So with that, thank you so much. And I hope all of you found this webinar useful and have a nice day. Mm -hmm.